بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Respected brothers, sisters and ulama Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh First and foremost, I would like to thank the organizers at White Thread Institute for inviting me as a lecturer to present on the theory of evolution and I think this is a very good opportunity to present on the Western intellectual tradition which is the need of our time and I applaud the White Thread Institute for this great initiative and I've been asked to present on the theory of evolution and what I've done is inshallah I will be talking about Darwinism with philosophy masquerading as science and the reason why I've chosen this particular area is because of its uh, it holds the controversial status at the science and religion interface and for that reason I believe it is absolutely necessary for Muslim scholarship to engage with these ideas uh, solely for the purpose to critique some of the misguided assumptions underlining uh, this theory which now has become a world view without further ado this is the session plan inshallah so i will start with the what by introducing evolutionary theory what is evolutionary theory and what is the evidence for evolutionary theory and then i'll move on to two main parts of this lecture so first part is the critique of common descent uh, which is the uh, pattern underlining Darwinian evolution and in there I'll be critiquing three different areas one is mystery of the Cambridge explosion then critique of homology concept and then I'll move on to critique of Haeckel's embryos in the second part I'll be covering a, uh, a critique of the pattern the process underlining evolutionary theory which is to do with peppered moth Darwin's finches and four-winged fruit flies. I've chosen these three areas. Uh, there are several others, but these are the uh, traditional and classical examples used in textbooks. So inshallah, we'll cover those. And I'll conclude by going through some uh, insights on uh, metaphysical assumptions of Darwinian evolution and how Darwinian evolution has exited the uh, methodological naturalism and has entered into the realm of uh, uh, philosophical naturalism which is why i've chosen the title uh, philosophy masquerading as science so introducing evolutionary theory what is evolutionary theory before i go into the technicalities ordinary parlance of the word evolution i would like to explore the origin of the word evolution and the way its meanings have changed over time as in its etymology so here i've displayed the early sense of the word evolution and uh, the word evolution it goes very long before darwin who was born in 1806 1809 so evolution entered oxford english dictionary back in 1616 uh, which is two centuries before Darwin had come to the scene and ironically this was the same year the church had issued official warning against Nicholas Copernicus system known as heliocentrism which is the astronomical model where sun is the center or more or less center to, of the universe and Christians uh, believed that this was blasphemy again against the uh, biblical account of uh, our centrality and had they known that evolution was going to enter the same year into the Oxford English Dictionary, they may have also issued a warning against this word, knowing that in the 21st century, this word will, this concept, a uh, worldview, will create such mischief uh, for the religious of the 21st century. So the background of the entry of evolution into Oxford English Dictionary is to do with the a translation from Greek work which was written by an author known as Elinus Tacticus and his second century work was then translated into English language and the word evolution came from uh, a, a concept military maneuver or change of formation which was then translated in English as evolution so the wheeling maneuver 
is where the word comes from. So this is the actual origin of the word evolution into Oxford English Dictionary. So what is the current sense of the word evolution? And this is the sense that Darwin took the word evolution into his book on the origin of species. And this word comes from Latin and the word evolutio in Latin denotes the process of unrolling, opening out or revealing a scroll. And because this had a chronological action associated with it, it gave a theological sense, a purpose and goal directedness. And Darwin was initially reluctant to use this term in his 1859 edition. Uh, the reason for that was because there was a theological sense associated with the word and Darwin was not fond of teleology in biology. And it was not until the sixth edition of the origin of species that Darwin actually included in his closing paragraph the word evolution. So initially Darwin did not have the word evolution in his book which was written on evolution. He preferred another term which was descent with modification. And then in 18th to 19th century evolution had become very well established term in English language and it denoted uh, the general term for uh, embryological development which is synonymous to ontogenesis. So it became a term which was associated with the gradual change in embryos. And if you study Darwin's uh, On the Origin of Species, if you read through the book, one of his strongest evidence was to do with the embryology. So that's something I'll be discussing through this lecture, inshallah. So this is the non-technical meaning of evolution now in common parlance. Uh, for instance, we say use in our day-to-day -day language, societies, politics, economic systems, worldviews, religious ideas have evolved. When we use ev evolution or evolved in this context, we mean change over time that goes back to some of the earliest uh, philosophers who use this term uh, in pre-Socratic pre Greek e era, such as Anaximander, Empedocles and Herculitus. Uh, for instance, Herculitus has been reported to have said that the only thing that is constant is change. So what he meant by that is that the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. So this type of general uh, meaning of evolution, uh, religion has been in, at intellectual peace with it for over 2000 years. It wasn't a problematic concept. It was only until it was only when uh, Darwin introduced evolution as a biological concept. Uh, in fact, evolution as a biological con concept was there before Darwin. Lamarck also introduced a naturalized uh, process for how evolution occurs in biological species. However, it was Darwin who then in, uh, he popularized this in, through another uh, concept known as uh, natural selection. And that's when religion and science came into com conflict with each other. And since then, we've seen that. So in the general parlance, the word evolution change over time has no problem. And religion has been at peace with this term. And there's not any issues uh, before, the, uh, before Darwin came to scene. So I'll be concentrating on the, not on the, uh, uh, you know, into etymology of the word evolution, neither would I be talking about the uh, ordinary parlance of evolution, the general uh, understanding. Uh, my focus will be on more technical aspects of evolution. So by mid 19th century, evolution had become a term known for change over time, which was understood at two uh, extreme extents. So you had uh, on one side Herbert Spencer who understood evolution to be how everything evolved and on the left side you can see Darwin and for him the question was how species evolved. And notice one thing here that Darwin's question was how species evolved and not how life evolved. Uh, so there are two separate questions in uh, science. So how species evolved is a question of how we have uh, biodiversity and how life evolved is a question that's associated with abiogenesis, which is the research associated with the origin of life itself from chemistry to biology. Uh, so these are two separate questions and Darwin's fundamental question was how species evolved, although there was some 
uh, association with how life evolved because he was his uh, his tree of life goes back to that last universal common ancestor and that last universal common ancestor comes from uh, chemical uh, to, from chemistry to biology and that's where life originated at that point and that's abiogenesis the research associated with abiogenesis so Herbert Spencer for him the issue was uh, to generalize Darwin's natural selection and make into a global account and global account of cosmic change. And he tried to encapsulate Darwin's uh, theory within a single framework uh, that permitted him to uh, apply this outside biology. So Herbert Spencer, he was a social Darwinist. Uh, so he also advocated this idea of social Darwinism and that is to apply natural selection to societies. Uh, so he compared societies to living organisms. On the, in contrast, Darwin, he restricted the term to biology and only addressed the question of how species evolved. There are some philosophers who argue that Darwin did gradually change his views and came to incorporate Herbert Spencer's ideas of cosmic change, but this is based on mere speculation and there is no concrete evidence to support this. Now I'll be talking about the question of how, uh, how species evolved, and that's the question Darwin introduced in his uh, on the origin of species, and he specific specifically talked about biological evolution, and to Darwin biological evolution was defined as descent with modification, and this was his theory of how species had evolved. So what is meant by that? First of all, descent. He viewed all beings not as special creations. So by saying that the uh, biological beings are not special creations, uh, he has ruled out any supernatural, uh, direct supernatural agency in, uh, in moving life from one form to another form. So he, he assumed that life is a lineal, so species arose through a lineal descendants from a few beings that lived in remote past, one or few beings. And he described that remote past to be a long period before the first bed of the Cambri Cambrian system was deposited. So we're talking about a period that's well before the Cambrian explosion uh, that, was, that occurred approximately 540 million years ago. So we're looking at over a billion years ago where last universal common ancestor existed according to Darwin's worldview. And this ancestry that Darwin talks about, the descent, is in fact a universal common descent of all life. And he's not referring to a, a species level descendancy which we as religious uh, people as well as uh, you know the other faiths that uh, Abrahamic faiths agree that life originated. Uh, we, we all, humanity originated from a common ancestor, Adam. So that's not what Darwin means. For him, common ancestry is a common ancestry includes extant terrestrial organisms in, coming from a single universal common ancestor, which includes humans as well as an, the entire animal kingdom. So all three domains of life, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, and archaea, all of them originated from a universal, a single universal common ancestor. That's what he means by that. And this has now become the central pillar of modern evolutionary theory to the common ancestry. And we're referred to as universal common ancestry. Throughout this lecture, I'll just call it common ancestry. Uh, so whenever I use this term for Darwin, Darwinian evolution, it means universal common ancestry of all ex extent life. And secondly, modification. So I, I mentioned that the definition of evolution to Darwin was descent with modification. So the second part is modification. What is meant by that? Well, Darwin meant natural selection by modification, which acts upon random variations in a population. And this is what Herbert Spencer, the picture I showed you just two, three slides previous to this, he dubbed this as survival of the fittest. It's also called reproductive success. 
and Darwin considered this as the primary and not exclusive means of modification and this is what he believed was the mechanism of modification and Darwin he speaks about this right from the start of his book his book's all about natural selection on the sixth page of the book in the introduction this is this quote is taken from that page so natural selection has been main not exclusive means of modification so these are two parts of Darwin's definition descent and modification so introducing evolutionary theory what is the evidence of evolution when you ask average people biologists and even evolutionists uh, what is the evidence of evolution what you will get from them is a pretty much uh, a list of same textbook examples that all of them will give and this is because majority of uh, educational institutes that adopt uh, teaching evolution they use the similar textbook examples for their biology curriculums so the students are exposed to the same classical evidences for Darwin's evolution so that's why when you ask that question you will get same answers and what I've done is I've listed 10 major textbook examples here in this slide uh, you can see miller urey experiment, Darwin's tree of life, all the way down to hominid evolution. And this is taken from Professor Jonathan Wells' book, which is titled Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth, which was published in 2002. And Jonathan, Professor Wells, he called it this Icons of Evolution because he believed that these examples have taken life of their own and they've become symbols of Darwinian evolution that go far beyond evidence. And in many cases, he believed that the, the Darwinian evolutionists, they exaggerate the evidence, they even distort and fake it, uh, fake the evidence in, in order to support the new Darwinian evolution. And we'll talk about that, some of these icons through the lecture, which, are, which I will cover under the pattern and process of evolution. So just briefly, I'll go through each one of them so that you, you're familiar with what these are. So first, he discussed Miller-Urey experiment. And this is a chemical experiment that supposedly stimulated the earliest conditions present on Earth uh, that, that permitted and were conducive to synthesizing amino acids, which are the fundamental building blocks uh, for life. So from amino acids, uh, we produce uh, proteins, which then go on to go through certain processes uh, to become functional pro proteins in our body that make up a lot of different uh, organs and uh, systems in our body. So without those amino acids, this would not be possible. So Miller-Urey experiment showed how, they, uh, how these amino acids could be uh, stimulated through some kind of uh, conditions which were supposedly what were present on the earliest, early primitive earth. And the question here is about the chemical origin of life, which I mentioned earlier on. Darwin's question was on the origin of species. Here the question is on the origin of life, which is abiogenesis, uh, on the chemical origin of life, which is abiogenesis. And how did the question here is how did life originate from chemicals to living organisms that we are today? So this is evidence of evolution, and this is known as Darwin's tree of life. And you can see it's a branching tree pattern that explains how life evolved on this planet. And this is taken from Darwin's 1837 sketch which was what he wrote in his notebook 22 years before he published his book on the origin of species. And what this shows uh, is a, the earliest theoretical insights of Darwin and in, in how he assumed a genus of related species. You can see species A, B, C, and D branching from a uh, single starting point, which is uh, labeled as one. So what Darwin believed is from this single starting point, these species branched out and you have species A and B, which are distantly related because of the distance you can see between the two and B and C are closely related and B and D are intermediately related. So this was what Darwin's earliest insights were on how a tree of life looks like. And it was this kind of diagram Darwin reproduced in his book on the origin of species just 22 years after the sketch. 
So he had been thinking about this for quite a long time. Uh, the thing to note on this uh, notebook is that on, on the top left corner, Darwin included a little uh, statement saying, I think. And what that shows is this is a hypothesis statement and it's not a axiom as neo-Darwinists have made it into now. So now it's become insulated idea that is not open to falsification. However, for Darwin, the question was, uh, I think that this is the pattern of life and it may, necess may not necessarily be like this, but this was his thought process based on some logic that he had available to him. So it's not a fact uh, as it's been shown to us through uh, some of the textbooks, which I'll show you. And uh, the, the new Darwin, the modern synthesis has taken this as a fact uh, of evolution. And that's where the problem lies. And uh, we'll see how this does not stand up to the challenge of being a fact of, ev uh, of evolution. So this is the third textbook, Evidence of Evolution. And what you can see here is uh, uh, various bone structures from vertebrate limbs. And what a neo-Darwinist will do is they will look at these uh, similarities between bone structures of vertebrate animals. And they will then assume that these similarities are due to homology and homology is redefined by neo darwinists as common ancestry. So this is uh, usually shown to represent uh, our com common ancestry. So we've got here, you've got human hands on the far left, human hand, and then you've got a cat's legs, you've got Wells flipper, and then you've got a bat's wing. And you can see the lineup of these bones are almost similar. So there's this, series of bones that come in a similar lineup. So they consider these bones as homologous structures that are revealing common ancestry of these animals. And we will talk about this in more detail under the section on the pattern of evolution uh, to do with the common ancestry and how this has been an exaggerated uh, science, especially the definition of homology, which is a circular definition. So inshallah, we'll cover that at that point. So this is the fourth textbook evidence of evolution, which is referred to as Haeckel's embryos. And these embryos are supposedly pointing out our common ancestry with fish. Uh, for example, Haeckel, he saw these similarities in embryonic uh, development in different animals. And he believed that these are recapitulation of these are recapitulations, which is a uh, replay of our evolutionary history in during our embryonic development. So that's what uh, the evidence, so the, the Haeckel's law, be, law became uh, uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. So this is known as biogenetic law. And what that means is ontogeny, whatever occurs during the embryolic, embryo, embryological development, it's repeat is repeating wherever has occurred phylogeny during the evolutionary past of those species and this is uh, you know based on some fraudulent drawings uh, some faked drawings of Haeckel which were which are still present in many textbooks as a supporting of uh, Darwinian evolution and we'll critique that in our uh, section on uh, in our first part which will be on the descent with modification inshallah the actual common ancestry. So this is the fifth textbook evidence of evolution, which is to do with a discovery of Archaeopteryx, which is which was discovered just a year after Darwin published his book on the origin of species. So book was published in 1859 and this was discovered in 1860. And it was long thought to be the transitional link between reptiles or dinosaurs and modern birds and is perhaps one of the most famous fossils uh, to be found during Darwin's uh, life and is still one of the fa most famous fossils till today. And this was an ancient bird uh, with feathers as well as reptilian tail and mouth with teeth in it. So you, I've indicated this with red arrows so you can see um, here. So that's a uh, feathers like modern birds and you've got the uh, 
the teeth that look like uh, reptilian teeth and you've got a tail at the bottom. These are reptilian features. So this, is, this was then taken to be a transitional fossil between reptiles and modern birds. So how flight originated. And uh, this became an icon of evolution for neo-Darwinists. So this is peppered moth, which changed color during the Industrial Revolution in the UK when pollution had darkened tree tr trunks. Uh, this was due to soot, which deposited on tree trunks. It's a powdery deposit that is found during pollution. And it was supposedly believed that these moths, they changed color from uh, white or conspicuous moths to black moths uh, because the tree trunk permitted a camouflaging effect for the black moths. So the white moths were preyed on by bird, uh, birds, whereas the black moths survived. And over time, the frequency of black moths increased, whereas the frequency of white moths decreased. And this is referred to as industrial melanism. And this is a typical textbook example of uh, evolution in occurring in action or natural selection occurring in action. And neo-Darwinists have used this uh, tech example for over 50 years in textbooks to show that natural selection does occur in nature and to prove that they've shown these moths resting on tree trunks and uh, you know, changing color over a period of 150, 100 to 150 years, um, which uh, one of the scientists in UK had experimented to show that there are more white moths being eaten, preyed on by birds uh, relative to the black birds, uh, black moths, uh, sorry. So anyway, the point here is that there is a change in frequency of these black and white moths, uh, which shows that uh, black moths increased and the white moths decreased over time. And this is natural selection in action. That's what natural selection does, increases the beneficial trait and it decreases the harmful trait. And here the harmful trait was assumed to be the white, whiteness or the conspicuous color of the moths. So this is another textbook evidence for evolution, which is known as Darwin's finches. And uh, these are a group of about 15 passerine birds on Galapagos Islands in the Pacific, which showed a remarkable biodiversity in their finch sizes and shapes. And a few years back, uh, Princeton University researchers Peter and Rosemary Grant, they had observed natural selection during a severe drought which occurred in 1970s, uh, 1977. And what they saw was microevolution changes in the beak sizes, and then they extrapolated from that macroevolutionary change. And that's now become a textbook example to show that natural selection does happen in nature. And these beak sizes, they change so much uh, there was a 5% change in the beak sizes, but the extrapolation was that if this continues over a period of about 200 years with regular droughts, then the beak shapes will change so much that there will be a point where speciation has occurred, that they've changed in the species uh, of the, the, ty the, ki the, the type of species that the previous beaks were, were would be changed to another type of species. And, they call that speciation, change from one species to another species. And again, this is an exaggeration because the actual change that was seen was microevolutionary change, not macroevolutionary change. And to assume that from 5% that a species will have occurred, speciation would have occurred, that's an exaggerated exaggeration on the, what the evidence was stating. So anyway, this will be something I'll be critiquing the second part of our lecture, which will be on the processes of Darwinian evolution. Now, this is another evidence evolution, which is one of my favorite one because it's uh, based on uh, genetic engineering and it's about four winged fruit flies. And what these were, they, they were genetic mutants, which seem to provide for some geneticists uh, evidence for how new features can arise through uh, introducing mutations, laboratory engineered mutations into DNA. So creationists had been arguing for several years that there cannot be any beneficial mutations. So neo-Darwinists, they did an experiment to pr produce uh, ben apparently beneficial traits, which you can see here in the fruit fly. So at the top, you've got fruit fly, 
uh, which has a balancer held here here and then you've got it's got two wings uh, one set of wing here and here here you've got another fly which has two sets of wings an extra set of wings coming out of its hull tiers, the balancers. So this apparently showed that there was beneficial uh, change that's occurred, a beneficial morphological change, a beneficial change in shape, anatomy, and you know the apparent features of uh, the, this particular insect. So the new Darwinists use this as an evidence that mutations can lead to beneficial evolutionary change. Uh, although here the balances were transformed into a new set of wings, which caused some, which caused some handicap to the uh, fruit fly, but that's something I'll be discussing in the second part of the lecture, inshallah. This is ninth textbook evidence, which is to do with fossil horses, and this is a long story of approximately 50 million years, in which fossil horses are put together in a in a series showing how our modern horses had evolved from a small dog-sized animal called Eohippus. And this is usually shown as ev evidence for directed evolution. And again, this is another textbook example of modern synthesis and it supports the modern synthesis of Darwinian evolution. And this is the most famous and most controversial evidence of evolution which is ape to human transition or uh, you know the this is a clade of great apes so you've got orangutan you've got gorilla you've got human being and you've got chimpanzee bonobo so at different points they have diverged from a common ancestor so there are three common ancestors a human chimpanzee bonobos have a common ancestor four to six million years ago and then you have another common ancestor further back into history with the gorilla and then even further back there is another common ancestor with orangutans which uh, permits a common ancestry of all of the species that you can see in this diagram and this is known as a clade you know they, they, this is various species that come from the same common ancestor so this is certainly the most controversial aspect of Darwinian evolution and here what they believe is that uh, these various uh, species, the uh, ape-like creatures, we, they all are, came from a, you know, a single common ancestor which was, which resembled ape more than humans because humans are the most distinct species amongst these five categories that uh, you can see from the picture. So this became one of the most controversial icon because here we have human being who is Ashraf al makhluqat the best of the creation, and to include human being amongst the animal kingdom is to, uh, is to challenge the theological standing on where in, in human stands in the picture of animal kingdom. And that's why this, this icon has brought a lot of controversy with it. And neo Darwinists find, for them, this is one of their favorite icon because this actually challenges religion right at its core. And it's still till today, fossils are being discovered and this is still controversial as it's getting more and more controversial because of the new discoveries that we are finding now. So of the 10 icons I've shown you, I will be focusing on just six of them. And you can see I've listed the six, three for the descent and three for modification. So you can see the descent is associated with the pattern of evolution. So in that, I'll be discussing Darwin's tree of life, homology in vertebrate limbs, and Haeckel's embryos. And on the right side, I've got modification, and I'll be discussing peppered moth, Darwin's finches, and four-winged fruit flies, and critiquing some of the, these evidences that are used in textbooks. And the reason why I've chosen these six is because they partly illustrate the two aspects of Darwin's theory, that, that is descent, pattern evolution, and modification post evolution, which I wish to critique in this lecture. So this is the way we'll divide the lecture. So part one will be on the pattern of evolution and part two will be on the process of evolution. So I'm gonna pick on a few textbooks uh, today in, because they are firstly widely used and they're ubiquitous. And secondly, because they draw upon the dichotomy, which I wish to uh, elaborate on during this lecture. So this particular textbook is written by Campbell, Reese, and Mitchell 
and it has an extraordinary reputation for its authority and accuracy. And these authors, they focus on big ideas of biology. And apparently, uh, this book has something to say about Darwinian evolution. And it defines Darwinian evolution by stating that Darwinism has a dual meaning. So there's two parts of this theory of Darwinism. First part is to do with the fact of evolution. So Darwinian evolution, this is the, that modern species evolved from ancestral forms. And when we talk about ancestral forms, descent from ancestral forms in Darwinian evolution, that refers to universal common ancestry and not ancestry at the level of species or lower level of taxonomic or hierarchy. And the second part of the Darwinian evolution is theory. And this is theoretical and controversial. This is where difference of opinions can occur within the scientific community according to Darwinists. Uh, this is natural selection is the main mechanism to explain the historical facts of evolution. Now here there is a subtle point being mentioned by the authors and that is descent is being called a fact whereas the natural selection which is the mechanism by which it occurred by which we've descended from that universal common ancestor the mechanism that pros the process that uh, led to evolution is controversial and open to debate but not the actual pattern which is uh, tree of life a bifurcating hierarchical classification of life so this is an illustration of what is being claimed in Campbell Reese and Mitchell's biology textbook as uh, Darwinism and you can see at the top I've included the definition of Darwinism with, which is it has due meaning taken from Campbell Reese and Mitchell and at the bottom I've superimposed to that uh, Darwinian uh, the mean understanding of Darwinian evolution taken from Campbell Reese and Mitchell onto Darwin's definition of evolution which is disadvantage we can see here on the right side is that modification is centered on natural selection which is the theoretical aspect of evolution and descent is centered on the tree of life which is considered a fact of evolution according to the Darwinian model and I want you to bear that point in mind because throughout the lecture you'll see that when they claim this to be a fact of evolution does it stand up to the challenge or not? Let's see the evidence that they are using and whether there are some weaknesses in the evidence. And if there is weaknesses in the evidence, how did they raise this uh, universal common ancestry to be to the level of fact? This is a question that needs to be asked to the neo Darwinists who promote this idea as fact of evolution that cannot they, they cannot be second opinion about it. So let's uh, look at some other textbooks. So this is another textbook in which the author is devoting the subject entirely to evolutionary biology. And this is a book for postgraduate level students. And uh, I, I personally use this book during my study on evolution because it's a book that's dedicated specific to evolutionary biology written by Douglas Futuyma. And it's a evolutionary biology third edition published in 1998. So again, descent from a common ancestor is considered to be a scientific fact. And for Tuima, he claims that this is a hypothesis so well supported by evidence that we take it to be true. So again, evolution as in common ancestry, so the component of ancestry, this descent from a universal common ancestor is considered a scientific fact. And it's considered a scientific truth according to Douglas Futuyma. And then he goes, then there's, this is another author, uh, Odysseus and Odysseus Bias, and they've written a book on life on earth published in second edition 2000. And this one is generally being used in undergraduate introductory biology courses around uh, many universities. And this is what this or these authors have to say about Darwinian evolution. They say, but they say that the theory of evolution states that modern organism descended with modification from pre-existing life forms. And then after a couple of lines, 
they uh, sorry in fact this after a couple uh, towards another uh, in another part of the book they have they state that virtually all biologists consider evolution to be a fact now here when they're talking about fact what do they mean they mean descent from a common ancestor so remember the dichotomy i drew out earlier on fact of darwinism and theory of darwinism here they're referring to the fact of darwinism which is centered on tree of life thinking which is universal common ancestor and on the same page the authors they say uh, that the mechanism of evolutionary change remains controversial and debatable so they write although debates still rage over mechanism of evolution change exceedingly few biologists dispute that evolution occurs so the fact that the pattern of evolution is rooted in the universal common ancestor this is not open to debate this is a fact for evolution however the actual mechanisms and the process that have occurred is still being debated and it's controversial that's what the authors are saying so why is descent from a common ancestor considered a fact the authors they explained it uh, because an overwhelming body of evidence permits no other conclusion now that is a very strong statement uh, from a scientist in regards to a biological phenomena that's overwhelming body of evidence that permits no other conclusion so we came from universal common ancestor and the evidence to support this claim permits no other conclusion that's the only conclusion that can arise because we've got so much evidence that there is no possibility that we may have arise from several ancestors now they are saying that there is an overwhelming body of evidence and what is the overwhelming body of evidence they're using here they're using three lines of evidences number one fossil record so they've listed it here and number two comparative anatomy and number three embryology now that's what my first part of the lecture will focus on these three to show whether common ancestry is based on overwhelming body of evidence or not and whether we are permitted to make other conclusions or not is the evidence so solid that there is no possibility of uh, alternative hypothesis uh, in other words what the neo darwinists are calling this is qatri it's unequivocal it's conclusive it's based on unmistakable premises that to that life has originated from that one universal common ancestor and it's almost that they treat this hypothesis and that's what it is it's a hypothesis because it's not based on direct evidence it's based on indirect means of uh, evidence such as fossil record and comparative anatomy and embryology these are not direct evidences there are assumptions involved here yet they consider this as a biological axiom it's a self-evident truth that is not open to any uh, alternative opinions and we will analyze that in our coming slides inshallah so here we have Odyssey, Odyssey and Bayer's claim in their textbook on life, on life on Earth, which is the key lines of evidence that permit no other conclusion include number one, the fossil record, number two, comparative anatomy, number three, embryology. And in today's lecture, I'll be critiquing these three lines of evidence with number one, mystery of Cambridge explosion. That will be in response to the fossil record number two critique of the homology concept which will be in response to the comparative anatomy and number three critique of Haeckel's embryos which will be in response to embryology and this is part two of my lecture so this is where i'll be covering the second part of the lecture and i'll deal with three major textbook evidences that support mechanism of evolutionary change as in natural selection so the first piece of evidence that is used to support natural selection is peppered moth evolution in peppered moth and second is darwin's finches and third is four-winged fruit flies to show that beneficial changes do occur through 
process of natural uh, process of evolution, natural selection, for instance, which acts upon random variations or mutations according to neo Darwinists. So here I'll be critiquing all three th these three by, by showing some weaknesses in these lines of evidences. So remember now, biological evolution consists of a supposed fact, which I've put on the left side in red, of descent from common ancestor. And on the right side, the, a supposed part of, a, a theoretical part of the theory, which is how evolution occurs. How does it happen? And this is based on the mechanism, which include natural selection and random mutations. So just bear this point in mind. Uh, that there is a distinction between the fact and the three here. So is descent from common ancestor a fact? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that descent from common ancestors can apply at many different levels. So I've shown here that right at the bottom, if you look at the example I've given, so if we look at this example of human population, I think we will all agree that we all descended from a remote human common ancestor at species level, and that was Adam Islam. So again, we believe in common ancestry. That's not the problem here. The problem is at what level of taxonomical hierarchy is this common ancestry assumed to be at? So for, for, for neo Darwinists, the issue is not at the level of species. Here I've given another example. We might apply common ancestry to cat family and it's quite plausible that big cats uh, like tigers and you know the leopards and so forth they have uh, they may have hybridized amongst each other different uh, in uh, amongst each other to create a di diversity amongst cats and so it's quite plausible that cats may have come from common ancestors at, at the level of family but not at the level of life which is the highest level so for neo darwinists the question of common ancestry is right at the top, which is at the level of life itself. The entire life has evolved from, so the three domains of life that are known. So now maybe there's another domain coming very soon on, onto the scientific market. At the moment, we only have three domains. So all three of these domains of life, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, archaea, they come from last universal common ancestor from which, which arose from so which was the uh, descendant of wherever arose from chemical chemistry to biology. So we went, you know, Miller-Urey experiment that I was talking about earlier on. So this is the Darwin, Darwinian evolution. All life evolved from that universal common ancestor, which is right at the top. All biological classification, all biological hierarchy uh, here, the taxonomical hierarchy, um, so universal common answers being applied right at the top level. And in today's lecture, I'll focus on the level of phylum, which is seventh level from the bottom. So if I can show that common ancestry cannot be demonstrated using fossil record, for instance, at the phylum or phyla, which is a plural phylum level, which is a major biological group, then anything that comes above it, so kingdom, domain, and life, becomes refuted. So we, I wouldn't need to give separate evidences for the rest of them. So you just have to show that at this level, common ancestry doesn't stand up to cha the challenge of uh, there's the evidence does not support, support and fit the theory that there is common ancestry at the level of phylum. So this is I'm sure